Yeah, is my mic working? Yeah, yeah. mine's working. OK, thank you. Um, thank you, Paul, for the, uh, the nice introduction. And I want to thank, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, honored by being asked to deliver the uh, uh, Thanasi Mulakas lecture uh, this year, this semester. The title of my talk this evening is intentionally provocative. It alludes, of course, to an awareness that the world in which we all live is full of problems, if not threats, personal, economic, political, cultural, national, and international, environmental, maybe even religious and spiritual. And what is also characteristic of our time is the extent to which engineering is so often proposed as a solution to one or more problems across many of these categories. Engineers think of themselves as problem solvers. There's not a clearly uh, in line of sight clock. So I've got my own here, but I have to keep it in line of sight. Let's see if I can do that. Take a very pers personal student problem, such as trying to decide what to major in. Um, so as to get a well-paying job. Students often settle on engineering as a solution. My guess is that this is probably the case for many of you. This was certainly a choice that my mechanical engineering father urged on me. There are also medical engineering solutions to many personal medical problems, from dental engineering to tooth implants, as, and as we age, biomedical engineered devices such as artificial hips and heart pacemakers. To the problem of how to make the United States more competitive in a global economy, no doubt the single most common response is to promote more engineering innovation. Engineering in some form, from civil and mechanical to computer and genetic, is regularly celebrated as the energetic engine of American capitalism. Even at the level of banking and venture capital investment, decision making, the controversial field of financial engineering plays a critical part. Financial engineering aims to guide liquid capital to the most profit-producing sectors and funds. Uh, why isn't, oh, I got it uh, here. Um, engineering is also regularly appealed to in order to address various societal, political, and cultural problems. Shortly after the 18th century emergence of classical, modern, civil, and mechanical engineering as new methods for constructing the physical world and mass producing the artifacts of material culture, social engineering emerged in the form of new methods for analyzing and designing social orders from cities to nation states. Between them, mechanical engineer James Watt and civil engineer Is Isambard Kingdom Brunel and their contemporaries radically transformed the face and life of England. The heroic age of industrial engineering created British national wealth and power, surpassing any previous in world history. But transformation brought with it deformation. Poet William Blake and novelist Charles Dickens exposed the engineering disfigured countenance of Albion in its nihilistic urban landscape. To quote Blake, in a city constructed by industrialization's dark satanic mills, he wandered through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames did flow and marked in every face he'd meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In Dickens' great social protest novel, Hard Times, it's not only the disfigured poor and exploited workers who suffer, so do other classes in struggling to come to terms with the creative destruction of an engineering transformed and transforming material culture. In response to the social dislocations generated by the Industrial Revolution, a revolution greater in material consequences than either the American or French political revolutions, philosophical critics such as Jeremy Bentham in England and Henri de Saint-Simon in France sought to adapt engineering methods for analyzing and redesigning society. Yet it was not so much social critics and philosophers who reformed the urban landscape. 
It was safety and sanitation and water engineers who shaped, who stepped in to remold the industrial life world into a more humanly habitable form, who rechartered and re-engineered the streets and Thames of London. The 20th century witnessed extended debates about proper scales for the conscious practice of social engineering, whether it should be holistic, as was attempted in Soviet Russia, or piecemeal, as advocated by John Dewey in the United States and Karl Popper in England. But whether driven by political ideology or individualist capitalist greed, nations became increasingly technocratic, integrating engineering attitudes and methods into government institutions and cultural life. Students today, both engineering and non-engineering, talk of designing their lives the way engineers design products. Exemplifying such integration was a covert contribution to piecemeal social engineering by Sigmund Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays. Bernays drew on Freud's psychological science to practice what he called engineering of consent. This social psychological engineering became the basis for advertising, marketing, public relations, and propaganda, and is now deployed throughout both the commercial and political spheres. Consent engineering is at the core of the algorithmic manipulation that goes on today in social media. High modernism provides another vivid illustration of the engineering infusion into what has increasingly taken form as a techno life world. One has only to look at Bauhaus style design, futurist and cubist painting, and the international school architecture to detect elements of the engineering colonization of culture with an engineering aesthetic. At the national and international levels, the engineered invention and development of weapons, both offensive and defensive, has become decisive for transforming and winning wars. Recall that the very word engineer didn't appear until the 16th century, which didn't appear until the 16th century, initially designated a kind of soldier. Engineers were in the first instance designers, constructors, and operators of engines of war, such as battering rams, trebuchets, and cannon. The term civil engineer initially referred to any engineer who was not in the military, who was applying military training to civilian construction projects. The Military Academy at West Point was the first U.S. educational institution to confer engineering degrees. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has been at the forefront of constructing forts to defend the coast and to suppress Indian resistance to white invasion, as well as dredging waterways and building dams to enable settlement through transport, irrigation, and energy production. Conservative military historian Max Boot in War Made New divides the history of modern warfare into four periods, grounded in technological revolutions. Gunpowder, the first industrial based in coal and steam, the second industrialization based in oil and electricity, and the information or computer revolutions. Although the first was artisanal or craft dependent, the last three represent forms, progressive forms of engineering. World War II was pivotal in the quantum leap elevation of engineering power, physically, social, and politically, most obviously through the new field of nuclear engineering. The engineered creation of the atomic bomb was decisive in ending the war in the Pacific. The engineering of a weapon of mass destruction put physical, physicist engineer J. Robert Oppenheimer on the covers of Time and Life, the two most widely circulated news magazines of the period. The new engineering disciplines of operations research and logistics were crucial to General Eisenhower's coordinated D-Day invasion at Normandy, General MacArthur's naval island hopping across the Pacific, and General Curtis LeMay's systematic firebombing of civilian targets in Japan. In recognition of the signal achievements of World War II military engineering and in an effort to institutionalize and broaden them beyond the national defense sector, a post-war collective of scientists, engineers, government administrators, and politicians created the U.S. National Science Foundation. NSF has become one of the most consequential independent agencies 
of the administrative or deep state, to use the contemporary pejorative term. As the war was drawing to a close, President Franklin Roosevelt tasked his science advisor, Vannevar Bush, who rose from being an electrical engineer and dean of engineering at MIT to become the first presidential advi science advisor in America and indeed world history, to develop a plan for how to manage this institutionalization. His report, Science, the Endless Frontier, proposed creating an independent, government-funded, National Research Foundation. After some back and forth in Congress, President Harry Truman signed a bill establishing the National Science Foundation in 1950, in which science serves as an umbrella term, including engineering, as it always does in popular culture. In Vannevar Bush's words, without, quote, without scientific progress, no amount of achievement in other directions can ensure our health, prosperity, or security as a nation. Looking back at American history, Bush noted how, and I quote again, it has been basic United States policy that government should foster the opening of new frontiers. It opened the seas to clipper ships and furnished land for pioneers. Although these frontiers have more or less disappeared, the frontier of science and engineering remains. It is keeping with the American tradition, one which has made the United States great, that new frontiers shall be made accessible for development by all American citizens. And I continue. Moreover, since health, well-being, and security are proper concerns of government, scientific and engineering progress is and must be of vital interest to government. Without scientific and engineering progress, the national health would deteriorate. Without science and engineering progress, we could not hope for improvement in our standard of living or for an increased number of jobs for our citizens. And without scientific and engineering progress, we could not have maintained our liberties against tyranny. Bush continues to note how from its founding, the United States government promoted scientific research for engineering benefit. From the creation of the Coastal and Geodesic Survey in 1807, the Naval Observatory in 1830, the Department of Agriculture in, 19, in 1862, and the Geological Survey in 1879. Through the Land Grant College Act, the federal government helped set up a system of agricultural and mechanical, or A&M, institutions of higher education in every state to make agricultural and mechanical engineering the basis of a new democratic engineering-based productivity. Bush further called attention to the 20th century creation of a suite of federal regulatory or deep state agencies to manage the dangers inherent in this new techno scientific world order. The list runs from the Food and Drug Administration of 1906 and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration of 1922 to the Federal Communications Commission 1934 and the Federal Aviation Administration 1938. The creation of such engineering dependent agencies, of course, expanded well beyond what existed in Bush's time. Think Nuclear Regulatory Administration, 1946, Environmental Protection Agency in 1970, and more. There are now more than 100 federal regulatory agencies dependent upon science and engineering and regulating the products of science and engineering. In short, for Bush, science and engineering have been and are crucial to creating and defending the American way of life. The United States is the first and foremost country living out a truth exhibited by Galileo, Leo, Galileo's telescope and Robert Boyle's air pump, that modern science is inherently dependent upon engineering and technology for its discoveries, discoveries which in turn infuse engineering throughout the social order. Think the contemporary scientific dependency on big ticket uh, Think the contemporary scientific dependency on big ticket glamour instruments such as the Hubble and Webb Space Telescopes and the Large Hadron Collider. Science as we know it 
could not exist without these engineered devices any more than we could possess the engineered conveniences to which we have become accustomed without them. In the US federal science budget, it's really engineering from top to bottom. But let's step back a moment and notice a subtle shift that's taken place in the political conception of what engineering can do for us. During the first 200 years, subsequent to its founding, engineering increasingly migrated toward the center of American life. It began when the U.S. Constitution conceived in order, when the U.S. Constitution conceived, quote, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings to, of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, in turn committed the new republic, quote, to promote the progress of science and the useful arts, in Article 1, Section 8. Never before in history had a state made such a commitment. A hundred years later, as Bush noted, the promise of an applied science polity was given renewed energy in conjunction with the war against slavery, which incidentally, the North won by virtue of its engineered industrial might. Now, along with advancing the American way of life, Bush saw engineering as necessary not just to advance it, but to protect it. One might observe that the movement of engineering toward the center of civil society was further enabled, if not promoted, by the constitutional separation of state and religion. At the same time as the state was prohibited from funding religion, it was charged with funding science. One kind of state-supported knowledge was replaced by another kind of state-supported knowledge-producing institution. Absent religion as a common bond, science and engineering progress suddenly began to take on the character of a new religious-like social glue. When Herbert Crowley in 1909 conceived the, reconceived the promise of American life in terms of a radical pluralism held together not by language or religion, he appealed to a common commitment to freedom, one of the most prominent forms of which has been freedom in scientific and engineering research. To repeat, during the first 200 years, engineering was conceived as saving us, not so much from enemies as from the scarcities, misfortunes, adversities, and oppressions of nature. Now that the American promise of continental conquest had been achieved, the, Americans, the United States discovered itself facing dangers and threats from foreign engineering nations for which American engineers were called on again to act as a kind of savior. Moreover, in the 70 years since Bush wrote, we have discovered a further set of dangers and threats rising not from others using engineering against us, but from the unintended consequences of our own engineering prowess. The dangers and threats of environmental pollution, climate change, pandemics, and unaligned artificial intelligence establish a new horizon within which to call on engineering to save us. Looking at American science policy from an altitude of 10,000 feet, we can see a distinction between two valorizations of engineering, one from, say, 1750 to 1950, enabling Americans to do what they wanted to do, finally, not being interfered by nature or restrained by nature. Another, once Americans succeed, succeeded in their collective birthing of an engineered and engineering life world from 1950 to the present, a science policy that, without rejecting the first, increasingly foregrounds an appeal to engineering for protection. From this 10,000-foot vantage point, we now parachute 70 years into the present, into our own world, and we notice two things. Excuse me, let me go. Recharge. One is increasing worry about a category of looming threats known as global, catastrophic, or existential risks. Another is continuing an ever more insistent 
appeals for engineering as the way to save us. Let's consider the risks. Research on catastrophic and or existential risk originated with recognition of the potential catastrophic consequences of nuclear warfare. Immediately after the bombing of Hiroshima, atomic scientists and engineers organized to educate politicians and the public about the dangers of nuclear weapons. One key effort was founding of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which in 1947 began featuring on its cover a doomsday clock in order to graphically represent what the engineers themselves saw as the danger. The closer to midnight on the clock, the closer to existential catastrophe is judged by representatives of the nuclear science and engineering community. There we have the clock. Um, uh, and, um, in 1947, it was set, first time, at seven minutes to midnight. Uh, with, the content, with the multiple explosions and testing of weapons, uh, it dropped in uh, 1949 to three seconds to midnight, and with the explosion of the hydrogen bomb, it dropped to two seconds to midnight. Until the present, that's been the closest it's ever been to midnight. With the uh, end of the Cold War, it went up to 17 minutes to midnight. But look where it's dropping down to now. Just um, originally said it in 1946 at 7 to midnight, 1953 explosion of the first atomic bomb advanced to two minutes. At the end of the Cold War, 1991, dropped back to 17. Since 2010, it's been advancing again until as of January 24th, last month, reflecting the war in Ukraine, the clock now stands only 90 seconds from midnight, the closest it's ever been. Pushing back what he, against what he considered excessive fear-mongering, in 1962, engineer Hermann Kahn, in On Thermonuclear War, argued for a more analytic and less fearful thinking about the unthinkable, his term. According to Kahn, nuclear war need not be an existential catastrophe, at least for the United States. It could be survivable if we would just engineer for survival by creating bomb shelters and other structures. Engineering could save us. The same year, however, conservation biologist Rachel Carson in Silent Spring broadened the scope of concern from nuclear weapons to chemical pollution, from physics to biology. In the process, she helped jumpstart the contemporary environmental movement. Creation of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in 1970 was one of the other of the results. Carson also turned environmental engineering from a marginal to a major discipline. Then, around the turn of the millennium, the world began to become aware of the potential catastrophic consequences of atmospheric of stratospheric ozone depletion and global climate change, Canadian philosopher John Leslie, in a book titled The End of the World, went beyond Kahn and Rachel Carson to analyze and parse a spectrum of recognized global catastrophic risks. There he distinguished natural disasters such as asteroid impacts and human-caused disasters such as nuclear war. But more important than such recognized risks, Leslie argued, were unrecognized ones. For Leslie, these included dangers as diverse as genetically engineered organisms, at that time they didn't exist, and the appointment of an apocalypticist Christian Secretary of Defense who might believe that nuclear apocalypse was the will of God. This possibility may have been suggested by President Reagan's appointment of James Watt from here in Colorado his Secretary of the Interior. On the basis of his Christian fundamentalism, Watt minimalized concern about environmental uh, degradation. The next decade witnessed an exponential growth in discussion about existential catastrophic risk, no doubt dragged along by the 2000 proposal to conceive the world in terms of a new geologic era called the Anthropocene that is, as a human-engineered geological era. One proposal for a planetary date stamp for the beginning of this new geological era 
is actually the layer of radioactivity laid down across the whole Earth by nuclear weapons testing from 1945 to the mid-1960s. In England, research on existential catastrophic risk became institutionalized at both Cambridge and Oxford universities in 2000 by, uh, stimulated by the 2003 publication of British royal astronomer Martin Rees's book, Our Final Century, in which he argued that the uh, uh, civilization had only about a 50% chance of making it through the 21st century. Two years later, Swedish philosopher Nick Bostrom founded the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford as part of the James Martin 21st Century School. In 2012, Martin Rees founded a complementary and competitive Center for the Study of Existential Risk at Cambridge University, and in 2018 updated his book on the future, on the future prospects for, updated his book originally of uh, our final century as on the future prospects for humanity. At both think tanks, the analysis of existential risks tends to be yoked to arguments for engineering or engineering-like solutions. In the United States, the Eco-Modernism Manifesto of 2015 of the Open California Breakthrough Institute, founded in 2003, tabled similar proposals. In order to get into the, 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 the rush to think about uh, uh, global catastrophic risk, uh, in 2013, more recently, uh, MIT created the Future of Life Institute to deal with four major problems, AI, unaligned, unaligned AI, biotechnology, nuclear weapons, and climate change. Now, to dig a little deeper into the engineering perspectives on apocalyptic discourse, Let's consider the single most comprehensive product of the Oxford Institute research program. Australian philosopher Toby Ord's The Precipice, Existential Risk and the Future of Humanity, published in 2020. This book has its own website and has been widely and favorably reviewed in places as diverse as Science Magazine, Notre Dame Philosophical Reviews, and The New Yorker. Incidentally, as far as I can tell, it has not been reviewed by any engineering-related journals such as the IEEE Spectrum or PRISM. Ord's thesis is that humanity currently exists on a dangerous precipice of potential civilizational collapse or global existential catastrophe driven primarily by human-sponsored uh, human uh, change. Ford begins by distinguishing between local and global existential catastrophe. In each case, civilizational collapse can be partial or total. Partial collapse would leave some humans alive but reduce it to a subsistence level. Full collapse would leave no human presence. As examples at the local level, compare what happened to the Easter Island population after they destroyed their environment, and the Anasazi at Mesa Verde are the Chernobyl exclusion zone after the 1986 nuclear disaster. Ord then argues for what he calls long-termism. Long-termism, quote, takes seriously the fact that our own generation is but one page in a much longer story, and that our most important role may be how we shape or fail to shape that story. In his view, and I quote, one doesn't have to approach existential risk from this direction. There's already a strong moral case just from the immediate effects. But a long-termist ethics is especially well-suited to grappling with existential risk. For long-termism is animated by a moral reorientation towards the vast future that existential risks threatens to foreclose. From the long-termism perspective, one can identify three threat categories similar to Leslie's. Current existential natural risks, currently existing anthropo anthropogenic risks, and risks of future technological developments. Existing natural risks, existing natural existential risks include asteroids and comets, supervolcanic eruptions, and stellar explosions. 
These are in some sense the most existential, but the least able to deter or able to engineer our way out of. And so, Ord spends the least amount of time on them, although he does credit NASA for its work detecting asteroid threats and designing deflection mechanisms. Existential, existential threats include nuclear weapons, climate change, and environmental change, environmental damage. Writing in 2020, Ord dismisses any return to a nuclear cold war as unlikely, a view that was and is perhaps too sanguine. The Russian threat of use in Ukraine and the existence of multiple nuclear weapon states hostile to the liberal world order, with others on the cusp of acquisition, has in just three years called Ord's assessment into question. His discussion of climate change relies heavily on the 2014 IPCC report and what is now generally recognized as the false optimism of the 2015 Paris Agreement. Not only was the, are the Paris Accords judged wholly inadequate by Science Magazine, which ran the numbers and said they simply didn't add up, but even that inadequate accord is not being lived up to by any of the signatories. The discussion of environmental contamination has also been quickly outdated. For example, it contained no mention of persistent organic pollutants, POPs, or forever chemicals. Ord nevertheless concludes that, quote, nuclear war, climate change, and environmental damage are extremely serious global issues, even before we come to the question of whether they could cause existential catastrophe. In each case, humanity holds tremendous power to change the face of the earth in ways that are without precedent in the 200,000 years of Homo sapiens. In accord with his own long-termism perspective, it is to future threats that Ord devotes the most attention. Future threats include pandemics, unaligned artificial intelligence, and various dystopia scenarios. Once again, the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic challenges some assumptions of Ord's analysis, especially the idea that technical solutions will be rationally and readily adopted. Ord does not leave things at the conceptual level, but surveys a large number of empirical studies related to each category. In his 421-page book, 170 pages, or 40%, is composed of small type, detailed technical notes and references. He knows the literature. Ord also spends considerable analytic energy trying to develop quantitative risk assessments for different scenarios. By his estimate, quote, we face about a thousand times more anthropogenic risk over the next century than natural risk, end quote. Indeed, his estimate is that risk from nuclear war, climate change, and environmental damage are each orders of magnitude higher than all natural risks combined. Integrating the risk landscape, Ord estimates a one in six total risk of existential catastrophe in the next 100 years. So he's a lot more optimistic than Martin Rees, which was one, which was one in two, right? Uh, to drive home his argument here, he quotes Winston Churchill, arguably the most consequential British prime minister of the last two or three centuries, from a speech Churchill made in 1946, post-atomic bomb, at Westminster, Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, and was broadcast on American radio. The dark ages may return, he said. The stone age may return on the gleaming wings of science and technology. And what might now shower in measurable material blessings upon us may even bring about its total destruction. Among anthropogenic risks, existing and future, Ord focuses on those engaged with nuclear engineering, weapons and power, chemical engineering, climate change, and other environmental damages, geoengineering, overreach in response to climate change, bioengineered pandemics, and artificial intelligence. Recent developments in generative AI once again up the ante. Threats involved can be either intended from warfare, terrorism, and economic competition, or unintended, side effects, secondary effects, dual use, etc. cetera. 
Engineers commonly present their work as solutions to risks rather than their causes. Balanced reflection nevertheless calls upon critical examination to be addressed to the risk cost benefits, not just of particular engineering products and processes, but of engineering more generally, including the risk talk that has become endemic to engineering practice. Here again, Ord strikes me as too narrowly focused. Engineering is the foundation of our techno-human condition and thus deserves to be assessed not only in terms of manifest benefits, but also in terms of latent fragilities, threats, and global mutations. Ord significantly downplays the way risks and vulnerabilities that engineering seeks to address are in many instances being introduced into human affairs by an increasingly engineered dependence on chemicals and new materials in the industrial, consumer, and medical sectors, not to mention the cyber infrastructure, while fundamentally altering the balances of non-engineered materials through mining and waste production. Ord fails to name engineering as the active risk-producing agent it is, instead preferring to reference the products of engineering, that is, technologies. Still, he does at one point call for a measure of moderation, however small, in our ongoing engineering productivity. As he puts it, and I quote again, growing up, I had always been strongly pro-technology. Oh, that's it. Pro-technology. If not for the plausibility of catastrophic catastrophic risks, I'd remain so. But instead, I'm compelled towards a much more ambivalent view. I don't for a moment think we should cease technological progress. But we do need to treat technological progress with maturity. We should continue our technological developments to make sure we receive the fruits of technology. Yet we must do so carefully and use some significant fraction of the gains from technology to address potential dangers, ensuring the balance stays positive. Looking ahead and charting the potential ha hazards on our horizon is a key first step. Or it even goes so far to put a monetary value on the fraction of engineered produced wealth that he thinks we should now begin to invest in thinking about potential dangers so as to exercise better engineering government. That is, how much should we uh, invest in his institution at Oxford University, right? And he says we should spend at least as much each year as we spend on ice cream. Uh, and he has the numbers for how much we spend on ice cream. Um, it's a fraction of 1%. Ord reiterates the issue in his penultimate chapter, Safeguarding Humanity with a version of the cultural lag thesis. The concern is that the expansion of technical prowess is taking place fact faster than the will or wisdom to manage it has become a standard trope since the Romantics. As Winston Churchill again had observed in 1930, while men are gathering knowledge and power with ever increasing and measureless speed, their virtues and their wisdom have not shown any notable improvement as the centuries have rolled on. And then again, five years later, referencing this same cultural gap, the gap between, that's open between power and wisdom, their one supreme task, Churchill remarks, our one supreme task should be to close this gap between knowledge and power. Echoing Churchill, Ord writes, that, quote, the current predicament stems from the rapid growth of humanity's power outstripping the slow and unsteady growth of our wisdom so that, and one last time I quote Ord, a more patient and prudent humanity would try to limit this divergence. Most importantly, it would try to increase its wisdom. But if there were limits on how quickly it could do so, increase our wisdom, it would also make sense to slow the rate of increase in power, not necessarily putting our foot on the brake, but at least pressing more lightly 
on the accelerator, end quote. In other words, even someone with a strong commitment to and faith in engineering and technology to advance and protect human health, wealth, and security, to reference again Vannevar Bush's mantra, suggests the need for some level of moderation. Let me slide toward a conclusion. <clears throat> By stepping sideways, away from my narrative of American faith in engineering and as the solution to problems small and large, from a story about the creation of an engineered and engineering world, highlighted by the recent emergence of a consciousness of anthropogenic global, uh, anthropogenic global catastrophic extinction risks, and slide toward an interpretive conclusion. Ord's policy proposal for slowing the momentum of engineering and technological change is not something easily engineered. Engineering may be able to reduce the velocity at which a vehicle accelerates or limit its speed by means of a feedback loop governor. Engineering is able to design processes and products that moderate whatever pollution or waste they generate by enhancing efficiency. Engineering can create a whole new discipline of safety engineering that aims to reduce fragilities and dangers in the products and systems of our engineered world. What it cannot of itself do is persuade people to marshal political action to adopt any such innovations. The parameters influencing adoption are already set in place by a cultural and political commitment to engineering. Adoption is, ultimately, is, adoption is an issue ultimately of politics, most often in our world mediated by economics. As soon as Ord broaches the engineering power versus wisdom gap, however, he sets it aside. He simply calls for more economic investment and research, effectively admitting engineering impotence with regard to what he admits is the most important issue. This mirrors his stance toward natural existential risks, such as asteroids and stellar explosions. Although these are, he admits, the most existential threats, they are the least able to engineer away, so Ord simply didn't spend very much time on them. His emphasis defaulted to anthropogenic or human-generated risk. The political question of how to reduce the ongoing problem in anthropogenic existential risk production in flattening or widening what he calls the precipice on which we are now perched is in a similar manner slighted in favor of more techno-scientific and engineering research. There remains a persistent, however qualified, belief that engineering and technology can save us from the expanding spectrum of problems and threats, whether existential or not. Yet on the basis of Ord's own analysis and admission, this would seem to be an unwarranted faith. Here then, a paradox emerges. Is it not the case that a persistent belief among engineers and the public that engineering can save us may actually make it less likely that it can? Engineering is able to do many things. It's very powerful and seductive in its power and its brilliance. We are all attracted to its achievements. But if there are indeed things it cannot do that are more important than what it is doing, then faith in it may obscure its limits and our need to turn and try to delimit it. Let me offer a simple-minded analogy. When you fall in love, your attraction to a person can make it difficult to appreciate who that person really is, his or her faults or weaknesses. Love can reveal the many positive features of another person. It's not so good at sponsoring a realistic appraisal of whatever negative features the beloved may possess. Realism only comes with time, and you get over the rush of falling in love. As long as you are madly in love, it is almost impossible to get over the craziness and indeed the dangerousness of love to moderate your behavior in relationship to one another. Additionally and finally, there exists a more fundamental problem. The simple fact is that engineering is not able to address 
the fundamental issue of what kind of world we want to live in. What is a good engineering world? Until we ask ourselves and reflect deeply on whether or not and to what extent we want to live in an engineered and engineering world, we are unlikely to live in that world in the best way. We are unlikely to practice what I would call engineered and engineering flourishing. My less, enthusiast, my less than enthusiastic and somewhat sobering conclusion to the question of can engineering save us is that no, it cannot, at least not simply as engineering. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, more than uh, we have 40 minutes for questions really? and talk. Great, great. Well, let's go to my clock. We have 35. Let's see if that light's working. I can uh, kick it around. <clears throat> Anybody? I have a question if nobody does. Thanks for the talk, Carl. Um, what, what stood out is the, the cultural lag, the sort of disparity between knowledge and power. And I'd just be curious to hear you talk about um, how you would envision sort of embodying work and a career within engineering, narrowing that gap, either slowing the speed of production or increasing knowledge. Uh, talks, but I, don't, I just have to give him what I think rather than giving advice for somebody else to do something. Um, the, the real answer is I don't know. I mean, it, it's, um, but there are engineers working with those institutions uh, that, uh, that I mentioned. Uh, Mark Tedmark at, um, at MIT is an, is an engineer. Uh, and um, uh, one of the things that I think has been, um, it's had the most salutary impact from engineers is the, um, there's, I guess, three different institute groups I'd mentioned. One, the, the uh, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Uh, that really, had a significant impact on forcing the United States and Russia to sign the Limited Nuclear Test Ban Treaty of 1963. Um, it, it, it helped galvanize, you're too young to remember, uh, there's some people in here who are not too young to remember. Uh, I mean, there were, there were worldwide, or European and American, and Japanese and Australian protests. Um, the, the United States and the Soviet Union at the time refused to sign, uh, to limit uh, above ground testing, re refused to limit testing. And we were introducing so much strontium-90 into the atmosphere that uh, it was falling on the ground, cows were eating it, it was getting into cow's milk so that Cow's milk was often uh, unsafe to drink. And more than that, uh, in, um, where is it, St. George, Utah? Anybody from Utah here? Uh, St. George, Utah is known as the, the uh, uh, downwinders. Uh, women could not breastfeed their babies because breast milk was so contaminated with uh, strontium-90 fallout from the testing in Nevada, and yet the United States wouldn't stop, right? So it would, because people didn't sort of know what was going on, and public sentiment had to be galvanized to do something. Um, and it was stimulus from, from nuclear engineers and scientists and, uh, who sort of galvanized the public. Uh, they created a separate institution, the Federation of American Scientists, which has an office on K Street in Washington. That's the lobbyist street. It doesn't have as much money as other lobbyists, but they have worked consistently to 
try to lobby Congress, educate members of Congress about the dangers of nuclear weapons and chemical weapons. Now they sort of broaden to chemical weapons. So this, this journal published in Chicago, uh, Federation of American Scientists, and then the Union of Concerned Scientists, which was founded at MIT in uh, 1969 or 70, um, to, uh, to protest the Vietnam War. I mean, dropping napalm on uh, uh, innocent civilians in the, in the war led chemical engineers to think, we don't want to be involved in this. And so a, a lot of stimulus in, uh, for intelligence support to halt the use of napalm, it never happened, but they, we tried to do it. Uh, but again, that came from, uh, from scientists and engineers. Um, Rachel Carson, uh, a, an applied scientist, a conservation biologist, helped stimulate, as I said, the uh, environmental protection movement. On the, uh, on the, there's a plaque outside, on the, on the, in the inside, in the foyer, of the Environmental Protection Agency that says, you know, this is, uh, we honor Rachel Carson when we created this. Rachel Carson was dead. She died of cancer herself in 1964. Uh, but the people who founded and created the, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, uh, saw her work as stimulating that. So this kind of public engagement uh, with institutions that are trying to educate the public about the reality of these risks, I think, is one of the things that, that engineers and scientists have the cachet and the clout in a world that pre-Trump, when we did believe in truth, uh, might have an impact on, uh, on things. Is that some kind of deal? Hopefully this works, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Um, I was wondering if you could explore what you think the risks of AI are, and what do you mean by unaligned AI? How could that cause a catastrophe? Um, I, I'm not a up on this stuff, but I'll tell you what uh, little I do know. Um, the term unaligned AI refers to an AI that's, that's, we should try to align AI with human interest. We want to build in uh, to uh, artificial intelligence program, some kind of restrictions. So this, we get to the level, get to talk about some kind of, of uh, stop on things. That you don't want an AI that could, uh, a learning program that, for instance, could learn how to design a uh, autonomous weapon. Uh, uh, that actually Tegmark, uh, uh, Tegmark wrote a manifesto or a, a public letter. One of the first things he did when that, uh, uh, that Center for the life, Future Life um, was create this uh, uh, little manifesto arguing that we should not create um, uh, autonomous we should limit the creation of autonomous weapons uh, because of the danger that they would go out. You know, obviously, we could we could design it one that would we could design a program to learn how to create more and more effective, like uh, poisons that we would never be able to create. In the, it would take us years and years to create in the laboratory, but we could create a program that somebody could use to create a toxin that the computer had generated that would be much more powerful than we might be able to, uh, to generate. So that he, we, we want to align any, and I don't know quite what align means, and they're not quite, they're not always, it's a fuzzy term, yeah. but uh, we don't want to create an, art, an artificial intelligence that is not aligned with um, basic human values.
So you talked a little bit about the difference between human wisdom and human technological power. Uh, earlier, you mentioned an author who described technology or science rather as an endless frontier. Would you characterize human wisdom and society as an endless frontier, or do you think that there are practical limits to that? Good question. Uh, all the questions are good. It's just that one grabbed me. I, uh, that's a grabber, a question. Um, yes and no. Um, that's a cheap answer, I know. But uh, there's, there's no end to things that we can, we can learn. And in, at some level, there's there's no in end trying to become wise. Uh, I've been trying my whole life. You know, I don't want to stop. Uh, I'm not very wise, uh, but I don't want to say, "Well, there's a limit, and I'll get there." Uh, it's, it's something that. So at, a, at, a, at an individual level, yes, but that doesn't mean we'll ever get there. You know, uh, there is, and there is a, a limit, simply by the fact that we're going to die. You know, so yes, we can keep trying to get wise. Um, I like the idea of being a sage, you know. I would like, I'd like to be a saint too, you know. But, and 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 I think we should all strive for that. And so, in that sense, there, there's, there's never any reason to stop trying to get wise. Um, but it is going to come to a halt. You know, I'm an old guy. I don't. Uh, I'd like to stay around for a little while longer, see if I get a little wiser. But, uh, but at the level of of groups, um, yes, there's there's some room for getting better, more wise in the way we handle things, but it's always fragile. It's. Um, I guess in a sense, it's like the individual too. I mean, you know, if, if, if I get really wise, then suddenly I'm gonna die. So it's all I'm gonna go. Yeah. Uh, well, in societies, we're, things are always crashing too. We had this uh, illusion that things are, are a progress, that it's always getting better. I, I um, um, there's a, a great, Chinese epic uh, called the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Sun Guo. Um, and the, the opening line is, uh, whenever the country is unified, it's going to break apart. Whenever it's broken apart, it will be unified again. That this sense in the Chinese historical consciousness, you know, and they've gone through what, dynasty after dynasty, lasting for longer than the United States has lasted, and they collapse, and they know they're going to collapse. Uh, but you live with them, and then when it falls apart, you get up, go again. Uh, and there's always a period of chaos in between. But, you know, Han, Tang, Song, Ming, Qing. You know, uh, and, and incidentally, I think that's sort of a consciousness even in China today. Uh, that's the reason they don't get quite as upset as uh, some countries do when they have somebody who's a little bit authoritarian or more than a little bit authoritarian. Well, it's not going to last. He's going to die. Mao died. You know. So at the, at the society level, I don't think it goes on. It just goes up and then it crashes. So that, that's a long roundabout answer. But it's, it, it makes me think. I'll think about it more, too. Oh? 
Yeah. Yes. Um, again, thanks for the talk. How much of the problem is that we pose the problem by making a noun out of engineering instead of I think that that's part of what you were saying in your answer to individuals are undertaking various educational programs. Does okay. that give you any more? Yeah, yeah, that's what that's. Uh, that's what I want about engineering, not just engineers. That engineering is a discipline, and it makes engineers. Now, other engin one engineer uses engineering to make another engineer, but I wouldn't want to say there are only doctors. There's not, there's not such a thing as medicine. There is a there is a discipline of uh, medical knowledge and skills, and and there's a discipline of engineering knowledge and skill and mindset and stance. Um, belief about who engineers are. It's a kind of a, a cluster of uh, consciousness and commitments. And um, that, that institutional reality has a strong tendency to take control. Uh, it's like the same thing like being an American. Uh, well, in a sense, there's only Americans. There's not Americanism. But by golly, if you want to be a certain kind of American, it's hard to claim that you're an American and live with it. You know? So I, I want to give some kind of, of power to a, a kind of consciousness or an idea, uh, too. Here, Lucky. Just for the recording, it's yeah. So I, I think of it the same way, right? It's it's, it's engineers who are humans to, to pick up from from last time. Um, and I love I love this. Uh, what, what you left us, the key thing you left us is this cultural gap, a wisdom gap, whatever you want to call it. And to, to your question is right on, right? Exactly. What what do we do about that? And and I don't mind giving advice even when it's not solicited. So, <laughs> so I, let, let me try let me try this and see if you agree. Right, that as engineers, the one thing you can do is realize that creating the tool is not the end of your job. Right, that y your job is to at least not make the gap bigger. You know, sort of theory of justice concept. Right, let's if let's not put all the world's responsibility on our shoulder because. We don't carry it all, right? We're not here to save the world, but we can help. So by why not? Uh, too much, too much. I, I, I don't. I think look. all of us should be here to save the world. Uh, I don't. I don't know that I agree with that, right? If if the end result of all of us doing our bit is that the world is saved, the world is equally saved, rather than all of us taking out, t taking all the responsibility, mm. just by view, right? So I would I would say. Create, as you create your tool, think about w w what is it that I need to do to not expand the gap, right? What, what, what wisdom or, or understanding do I need to add to the, to the asset column of the world so that the gap doesn't get bigger? And, and that may not be that much, right? I mean, I, I think what I mentioned last time is just, just be honest about what you don't know about the tool. That's going to increase the wisdom, right? People are going to think about um, the risks and the unintended consequences and all that. So you don't have to have all the answers, but do you know what I'm saying? So it, it's, it's, it, it, if we as engineers stop just saying, okay, I've created this phone, my work, we're, we're, you know, we're done. Thank you. Right. Let's, let's, uh, let's do the extra step and either gen, you know, generate the knowledge or help others generate the knowledge, uh, so that the gap at least doesn't grow, but hopefully it gets well, smaller. Okay. I guess I, that's what I answered to. What, Ryan, huh? Is that right? Connor, Connor. That, but it's not just to do the best we can. Then you have you have an obligation to explore 
the problems that it's creating and, and help educate the public, right? Yeah, is but, it, but, but my point is that if you demand of an engineer to solve to foresee every potential I don't demand I don't I don't demand anything. Uh, I invite, I appeal. But if, uh, but if their rated as not succeeding uh, if they miss some, some consequence, then, then you're discouraging them from even trying to do the least thing, right? Maybe. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry. This is just in response to this. I think one of the problems, though, as we frame this is that I think at best one could argue, but it's dubious whether wisdom in the last thousand years has increased much. Uh, maybe there's a small positive slope. But the problem with the gap is that we all acknowledge technology is on an exponential growth curve. And I mean, I, I bet lots of us were amazed as we look at this. Yeah, we didn't need a FAA before 1938 because we didn't have a plane problem. Right. We didn't need any of these other things, a communications commission, because it didn't exist. Right. 100 years ago. And I think that's that's a part of the really harshness of this problem is that the gap by definition is getting larger and it's a bad actor gap where a limited amount of uh, fewer 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 people can do more and more and more damage. Yeah. No matter how collective we may be wise in the United States or through protests and other things like that. Yeah. I agree. So I was wondering if you could Sandra syndrome. Yeah. Right. That that um, the unwillingness of society uh, and especially engineers mm -hmm. to take seriously uh, the kinds of things that you've spoken about tonight. You know, cautionary views of technology and science. Mm -hmm. I look around this room and I can't help but notice that it's almost entirely young engineers here. Mm -hmm. Right. And and it's not, I don't see much in the way of engineering faculty. Um, and I'm wondering if you feel like younger engineers are more interested in hearing what you have to say. That's my experience, but I have a very selective sample, <laughs> you know, a very small sample that uh, um, the, uh, but, but yes, uh, that uh, my experience, uh, you know, I taught for, uh, 25 years at Colorado School of Mines. And um, when I went there in 2000, uh, the, um, well, actually, I went in 95 and I came back in uh, 2000. So when I taught there for uh, 20 years, 20 plus years, started, there was a real resistance to uh, environmental engineering or environmental stewardship or even talk about sustainability um, that, uh, as I'm sure you've seen here too, there are bumper stickers with Earth first, exclamation point, we'll mine the other planets later. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but you don't see those anymore at, at, University, at Colorado School of Mines. But, uh, and, uh, Certainly there's been a, uh, like the humanitarian engineering program, which uh, actually got, I, I helped start it at Colorado School of Mines, but it was stimulated by uh, a guy here in the civil engineering program. Um, Bernard Amade? Yeah, Bernard Amade. I got him over to give a talk and that led to creation of a Engineers Without Borders uh, club which then turned into a humanitarian engineering program, which now offers a master's degree. So, you know, that's, that's something that's a, um, a positive thing. There, there were not, 25 years ago, that just would have been a non-starter at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, so, yeah. I'd like to say something in response to the idea of you know, people ought to get credit for just kind of doing their basic job, even if they don't go beyond that. I'm a retired pediatrician. I'm not a urologic surgeon, but 
if I were a urologic sur surgeon and I was really good at doing prostatectomies and I noticed that your prostate was big and I convinced you that I needed to do a prostatectomy on you when you really didn't need it, but I did my job and I did it well, do I get credit for that? Or if so, what kind of credit? <laughs> <laughs> Not sure I was talking about just doing the job. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a fraught project for a man of my age. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Sarah? Thanks, this was great. Um, I had a question about long-termism. Okay. Um, which has kind of gotten some press recently. Uh, what's his name? Sam Bankman Fried, uh, the crypto guy that just got arrested, <laughs> yeah. was a big long termism kind of yeah. proponent. And, and it, it, the whole sort of premise of it got kind of dinged, right, with, with sort of what happened with this guy getting arrested and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. if you sort of know the case, can you maybe talk more about it, how useful you feel as though that is as a, as a philosophy? It kind of, I think it's caught hold a lot in the tech world. And so I'm just sort of curious your take on the goods and bads you. You went over a little bit of that in your talk, and if you have more to say, I'd love to hear it. I, I, I'm not aware of the connection with uh, Bogman Fried. Uh, yeah, he was, he was like a philanthropist for, for, yeah. for effective altruism. Effective altruism? Yeah. You know it? No. Okay. What? So if we explain it just a little more. Tell me a little more. Yeah, so uh, the critics of it, and, and I haven't, haven't read the mm -hmm. book you discussed, so, you know, the critics of it kind of talked about how... Um, it absolves individual. This idea that you have to think multi generationally kind of absolve individuals of of agency in sort of the the problems of their own life. Oh, like sort of okay, your okay, life doesn't okay, matter. You okay, have to put it towards okay. the greater good. Yeah, and, yeah. And that sounds like uh, uh, Marxist. Uh, you know, sacrifice now and the next generation and the next generation so that the future will be get better. Right. That's what it sounds like to me. I think. So. What's what's your take on long termism? Like just sort of off the cuff though. Well, I think for, for uh, Toby Ord, long-termism just means trying to, to look long-term at what m might be a short-term gain, uh, consider the possibility of long-term harm rather than uh, sacrificing the present for the future uh, or not paying attention to the harm in the future and now because eventually it's going to be better. Uh, I think it... Uh, for Toby Ord, it's um, thinking bigger, bigger picture uh, would, would be the way I'd put it. Uh, but I'll have to, I'll have to look at the, this uh, crazy venture capitalist cyber currency stuff. Somebody over on the other side of the room. Yeah. I've been playing to one side of the room. I'm sorry. Um, go ahead with this one. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we've been hearing a lot about this like idea of what's our responsibility as engineers, assuming that engineering is something that we can like use as this, uh, or at least as engineers, we have some uh, capability of of anal of social analysis and impact analysis uh, from kind of the the word using the philosophical industrial complex that is the left side of the room right now um, and I, I guess I'm just kind of wondering like we mentioned this this gap between the very small linear increase of wisdom and that exponential maybe quadratic maybe whatever yeah. um, kind of increase in in technology and and um, I guess, engineering prowess, technical prowess. Mm -hmm. Yet we see time and time again, we, we saw with the gap between our understanding of the potential impacts of nuclear weapons and the eventual response by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And then again, with the understanding of, uh, of chemical impact on the environment. And then later, as in much later compared to, I guess, the atomic response, mm -hmm. Uh, the establishment of things like the EPA, taking a very U.S.-centric uh -huh. viewpoint. But today we see that problem again with the education of especially the people 
uh, in power that we kind of, uh, I guess, at least I see we're relying on to do the work of regulation that kind of cuts back or, or as you say, slows down the accelerator on some of that innovation yeah. to avoid uh, the death of all humanity, <laughs> right? Um, and that's largely, I think, in the United States represented by legislation. Today, we're seeing this huge gap in the technical understanding of people in legislation and the immense amount of technical prowess and evasion prowess in like technology companies, mm. Google, Facebook, whatever we yeah. see it in the news constantly, there's a very public perception of it, yet we're still doing a lot of work to kind of refine that understanding so that we can even figure out how to regulate it. I mm. mean, last month there was a conference here, right here at CU, uh, or I guess a, a collection of people, I don't know if it was a conference, called the Internet's Midlife Crisis. Mm. And the entire point was just saying, what's going on with the Internet? How do we even think about this from an ethical viewpoint? What is good? What is bad? We don't really know. Mm. So I guess my broad question following from all of this uh, extensive background is, it seems like we're not going to end this problem of, uh-oh, there's an issue. Let's have this seemingly increasing time gap of how to solve it, even though we kind of know at least basics of how to uh, understand its impact on society. Mm. Why is there, even if there is that gap between our understanding and, or, or rather, the gap between our wisdom and our ability, the little bit under that wisdom curve is is still enough to say there is something we can do. Yeah. Why is it taking yeah. so okay. long okay. to move into the space of doing? Yeah, I, I, I like that phrase. There's, a, there's, a, there's, there's enough under the wisdom curve that gives us um, some basis for action. Um, let me pick up on the thing you made about laws, too. Uh, back to Connor, your question, what can, what can you do? The... There are always jobs as staffers on the Hill. Uh, that, that's, that's true. I mean, it, uh, you can go knock on you know, a, a, your representative or senator's door and say you'd like to be an intern. And you can begin to provide some kind of advice that will increase the wisdom. Our politicians. I better be careful what I say. But it doesn't take much wisdom to help increase the wisdom of our politicians. Uh, and uh, a few years ago, I was teaching a course in, in science policy at Colorado School of Mines. And so I took it on myself to invite the Republican senator of the time to come to class and say, give us a charge. What? What do you need some advice about that we might be able to help you? And so he gave us a project, right? And so it was a class. We did it, our little uh, report, uh, white paper. But it probably had no impact, that's true. But it, it, was, it was an experience that then, I've also done, I, I've also had a courtesy appointment here at Colorado School of Mines with a what used uh, an old institute, the Center for, well, the Center for Science and Technology Bo Policy Research, uh, here, and uh, from there, we regularly graduated students who then got jobs on the Hill. I still I still know people who were staffers uh, on the Hill, and uh, I know small little stories from just a few examples, but. Uh, Congressman George Brown, he's long dead now, but he, he was the chair for a number of years of the uh, House Science and Technology Committee. He was a real, he was a kind of wise man. Uh, he, he knew how to do things differently. Uh, we haven't had somebody, we haven't had a, an engineer in Congress who had any power in quite a while. Uh, so, yeah, but I, I like that point about it. There's enough there you can do something. We can't, no reason to throw up our hands in despair. What? I go on too long in my answers. 
I feel like this is something of an indecent question after that. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you because you began with. Excuse me, I got a, I have a runny nose. When I talk a lot, sure. it uh, gets me all excited, and my uh, handkerchief is way over here in my coat pocket. Um, <laughs> You're running from my indecent question, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm running away from your question, right? <laughs> um, you began by talking about how um, the American attitude towards engineering um, grew up, right? Yeah. And in a certain sense, technological innovation finds its home in a liberal democracy or in liberalism, yeah. right? Yeah. This is what makes it possible. You get rid of the restrictions of religion, all kinds of things, right? right. Um, so I wonder to what extent this, or your thinking about these issues has, lead you, has led you possibly to rethink liberalism. You know, mm -hmm. like, is it the case that there's a way out of this from within liberalism? And I think your question was sort of getting at on the ground, like how it is that we can affect these changes. But do you think that we ought to be are you considering, a plant in the audience? <laughs> considering more radically, I mean, you know, I when just you look wrote at a piece on, when you look at China, the, the, the uh, uh, National Academy of Science uh, publishes a journal uh, monthly called Issues in Science and Technology. It's the policy journal of the National Academy. Last month, I have an article on that, uh, tell, arguing. Tell that, us. That, tell uh, us that, about it. It's a uh, uh, you, you know Francis Fukuyama. Okay, well, his most recent book is Liberalism and Its Discontents. And I wrote a review essay of that book uh, arguing exactly that, that uh, uh, some of the problems with, uh, uh, of science are liberalism. It's too much freedom. That we've, we have, we're addicted to freedom, and there may be problems with that addiction uh, in science as well. Uh, that... Uh, well, yeah, I agree with you. No. So does that mean reform? Huh? Does that mean reform, or does that, how, what's the trajectory of your thinking on that? Or is you, are you just wanting to acknowledge our problem at this point? Um, well, I could, I mean, I, I, can, I can think of concrete policy proposals to make, um, and, uh, the um, some of them are, are are being enacted, even as we speak. Um, over the course of the last twenty years, well, let's see. Congress has enacted has required more and more uh, some kind of minimalist ethical reflection to justify research. Uh, that didn't exist. Uh, see, when, uh, see, it used to be that, I'll just take, take human subjects research. There's the, there's the best example. We put a lot of limits on human subjects research that did not exist um, until really 19... 50s, and then we discovered that we were still doing things like uh, uh, the Tuskegee uh, syphilis studies, where we just let African Americans who had syphilis don't treat them, even though we have we have penicillin uh, would cure it. Let's see what happens. How do they die? Uh, it's horrible. Uh, so we've really ramped up uh, human subjects research ethics, um, and. Initially, when NSF created the guide, the, the template for making proposals to get funded, there was no question, of, you, weren't, you weren't asked any questions about what are called broader impacts. Uh, now, there were, there were only two, two criteria for, that you had to meet. One, that it had to be um, interesting to other scientists, and two, that you had the resources to do it. Uh, that you know you had a, a good enough CV and you had an institution which had the accelerator or whatever you needed to do it. Two criteria, Merit, uh, uh, 
intellectual merit and um, I forget what it was worded, but uh, um, enough, enough uh, education of the person proposing to, to do it. Uh, but now there's seven criteria, and uh, three of them are have to do with broader impacts. It's called. So that's a that's a big change. It's uh, I think it still more needs to be done along those lines, um, but that's a big change. Uh, is that Carl, um, I just want to ask this question. I mean, I have many questions. You finally get one. Huh? Okay. As someone who spends uh, some of your time in the uh, CCP party state, the Chinese regime, mm -hmm. do you have any insights into a kind of comparative regime assessment regarding technological governance? It's definitely more tightly governed. That's without a doubt. Now, whether it's better governed is another question. Uh, but, um, and, and whether ethics is, um, plays a very big role is another question still. Um, but in fact, just this morning, Beijing time, uh, I have a, a, uh, a colleague uh, at a university there who does research on um, uh, gene modification of human beings, especially the He uh, case in uh, Guangzhou when uh, uh, you know, he created those test tube babies with uh, modified the, the genetics of the babies. Uh, when was it? Uh, 2015, I think, right? Um, so she's done research on, on this and has written a couple of articles um, critical of the government for not having stronger uh, restrictions on that kind of thing. And, yeah, you know, he was arrested. He spent three years in jail. Uh, have we ever put, have we ever put a scientist in jail for doing research? <laughs>